right. All right. Blessing. Blessings. Um, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. The world is calling today. Happy Friday. All right. Now we know what holiday of the world is coming up this Sunday. And the Lord uh, placed it in my spirit to go ahead and speak on this. Um, we see on the screen here. Easter on the altar. Now, this is the first installment in a series that I'm going to be doing. The series is going to be entitled Slaughter of the Sacred Cows. And this is the first sacred cow that we're going to put on the altar today is Easter. All right. And so uh, here we go. Matthew 7, well, chapter 7. Verse 13 through verse 14 says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. And some uh, iterations have uh, only a few be there that find it. Um, so that's just going to set the premise here. Um, if the path to him is narrow, the only alternative path is the broad one, which you can travel by way of being misled. Being misled is a cousin to being deceived, which also is in relation to being ignorant, which in its most primitive and innocent state is being naive, which also lends itself for one to be easily led astray from a lack of knowledge thereof. Also, the choice lies therein to veer off the path he lays before us. With that being said, can we be held accountable for what we don't know? Hosea chapter four, verse six says, my people are destroyed from lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I also reject you as my priests, because you have ignored the law of your God. I also will ignore your children. The forgetful nature of man isn't just by way of negligent misplacement, but essence and meaning can become casualties of skewed doctrine being lost to translation figuratively and literally. We can absolutely and most certainly be held accountable for what we don't for what we don't know or have forgotten, even more so from what we reject knowingly and consciously, choosing to veer off the path. I've heard folks say something to the effect of, Our God is such a graceful and merciful God that he would not allow us to be tricked. But the word of God disagrees. Second Timothy chapter two, verse fifteen says. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Oh, man, this word of truth right here, this word of truth, you know, and I am in the NJ, NIV. I can tell by what that, how that said. So we're going to go to the KJ. We're going to go to the King James. Because it's worded in a way that I like it better here. There we go. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Uh, there's another verse in there that uh, talks about us being lovers of truth. Lovers of truth. So if you're a lover of truth, again, as I've said before, you know, I deal in absolute. So if you're a lover of truth, that means you hate a lie. But in retrospective hindsight, if you're not a lover of truth, then you are a lover of a lie. There are all, there's only truth and there's only lies as a direct opposite of that. There's no in between. All right. And so this verse right here. Um, it's left up to us to discern and weed the truth from the lies. The lies are plentiful and in abundance. You figure, given the sheer scope of the broad adjective depiction of the path that leads to destruction. 
considering the greater multitude that would travel the broad path as opposed to the lesser of the multitude that would travel the narrow path implies that the broader path is the most popular path to take, more crowded, mainstream, where the majority commute, the many, one of those five-lane highways jam-packed. While the few take the path less traveled, it's narrower. Not a lot of space, but still gets its commuters. Maybe the shoulder lane, less popular, and not as crowded. The few versus the many, as it talks about in Matthew, chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. We're going to go to this verse right here. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. And we're in the KJV again. Ah, I'm going to set this to KJV. I don't like the, the NIV with the sum of the words. The word is a word, but I really like the KJV. So it says, Colossians chapter 8, verse 8 says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Ah, that good old traditions of men. Notice the words. All right. Now, tradition lends itself to being ritualistic, religious, repetitious, regurgitated. Also, to put traditions or customs into another perspective that are widely or broadly accepted, highly regarded, acknowledged, followed, adhered to, customary. Then we have men, or what I like to term default man, who creates these traditions. What does the word say about the default man? <coughs> Excuse me, bless me. Matthew chapter 15, verse 19 says, ah, oh my goodness. No, 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 no. Come on now. All right. For out of the heart proceeded evil things, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. All right. This is the default man right here. Okay. Default man. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. And good old NIV is there again. Why does it keep defaulting to that? <laughs> All right. Praise the Lord. Here we go. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9 says, The heart is de deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Again, default man. All right. Chap uh, excuse me. First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Again, KJV. says, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, but they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spirit because they are spirit spiritually discerned. Yeah, excuse me. But again, default man, natural man. Again, that's the same thing as default man, natural man. First inclination. All right. Again, this is without the love of Christ. Without the love of Christ our first and second nature is what we have, what the is word, word is saying, all right? Um, again, just driving the point home here with this. Mark chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. KJV, here we come. All right. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceedeth evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, uh, lasciviousness, yeah. an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. This is the fault, man. All right? The fault. This is the flesh. This is what we're wrapped in. All right? Before we're washed. 
and have uh, the ability to come to overcome this flesh, in, you know, by the spirit of the Lord being within us. This is how our flesh is as a default. All right. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. Really makes you want to go out and make some random friends, huh? <laughs> the point being driven home in this instant is that the intentions of default man's heart usually have a dark ulterior motive. If man's spirit is not washed by the blood and word of Christ. Even at man's conception, our first initial inquiry made towards our nature proved to be corruptible and fallible. Hence, Adam and Eve, meaning... We got it wrong on our first day out the gates, Adam and Eve. Taking into account the things the scripture says about default man, ask yourself, are we to trust the traditions or customs that default man creates are of good nature and stature in the eyes of God? Moreover, are we of good confidence at entrusting man with instituting these traditions and customs which are looked upon as biblical? One thing for sure, two things for certain. If God tells us to do something, it is clear, concise, and easily referenced. Man has a tendency to add things on over time in a commemorative light that has no basis or reference of God having told us to do in the Bible. That word commemorative is dangerous when it is used in relation to something dealing with anything biblical. It is an addendum that over time can replace or supplement the actual thing it was added to, which for all intents and purposes, in this instance, is its ultimate intent and purpose. It's like decorating an officer. Sure, recognizing an officer for acts performed is pertinent, even encouraged, but too many, decor excuse me, but too many decorations on the officer, and you'll start taking more note of the medals on the man and not the man under all those medals. Mm. Thank you, Lord, for this word. Thank you, Lord. Mm. Thank you. Mark chapter 7, verses 7 through 9 say, They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding onto human traditions. And he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. Again, the word vain is used here again, like in the Colossians verse. An act that is without cause to its intended recipient, unwarranted, excuse me, unwarranted, not needed, not noticed, need I say, extra, almost revered in a disdainful and distasteful way in its received context. I almost chuckle with thinking how the Lord is rolling his eyes in that verse. Studying to show thyself approved is more than just studying the word of God. Secular knowledge only comes and should be by default comes second to the word of God, which needs no backing. A funny thing happens when the word of God backs up secular knowledge itself. Doesn't necessarily or really lend credence to the word of God, but it lends credibility to the secular source itself. One of my favorite ways of studying is by way of, of uh, etymology, which is the comprehensive research on the origin of words, meanings, traditions, and customs. I find it pertinent to understand where things originate, where they come from. The old saying goes, if you don't know where you come from, you won't know where you're going. The only instance of Easter appearing in the Bible is Acts 12, chapter 4. And I'm going to bring that up here. Uh, I didn't have that in my arsenal here. Ooh, there's no 124th chapter. What am I doing? Amen. Let's get it. Acts chapter 12, verse 4. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four uh, quat uh, quaternions, uh, quaternions ugh, of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. So, uh, 
Let's see. Now, the thing is, I'm not going to dive into the sinkhole debate on translations. You know, I'm going to, you know, I'm raised on KJV. So um, I'm going to just go off what my version reads. That's why I keep going back to KJV. Um, so we know the original word of God was in Hebrew um, in the Old Testament. New Testament, uh, it was in Greek and, uh, you know, therefore, you know, translated from uh, Latin to English. Now, the word Easter is the Greek word Pashe, which is derived from the Hebrew word Pesach, which means Passover. Thing is, there is no Greek word for Passover. Only one word exists in Hebrew for Passover, which is Pesach, which is not one of those words that can be applied dualistically in regards to meaning. It can never mean Easter. I only reference the dualistic nature of some words that are capable of being used in such a fashion because you find this form, excuse me, you find you find this from time to time in the Hebrew to Greek to English translations, where one word will be used a few times over, but the Hebrew lexicon or Greek lexicon has a different word that can have a different word or context in its usage, therefore implying a different meaning. Now, if you've caught it, that means the feast of uh, excuse me, that means the feast of the Passover Passover outlined in Leviticus 23, chapter 4, which I'll reference here. For these are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which he shall proclaim in their seasons. Um, these traditions, these, these, these feasts, rather, these, these customary days that the, you know, God, um, told us to recognize, these were still being recognized after, after Jesus's crucifixion in Acts 12, 4. And the word Easter having nothing to do with the resurrection of Christ in that passage, as we've come to celebrate in, in uh, modern times. But we know the Passover and the act of smearing the lamb's blood on the doorpost so the angel would pass over that dwelling is symbolically significant, being that Jesus refers to himself as the lamb of God in John 129. So we'll pull up here. Which, say, which says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Um, now, Jesus' blood was shed for us during the crucifixion and uh, resurrecting three days later. And we're told to honor uh, and uh, in re remembrance of him uh, in the last supper, which is the act of communion. Now, all biblical references that I will omit for the sake, you know, common knowledge, we should already be know, you know, knowing this. Um, we we should be knowing a few of these things, and if not, we need to go back and look. All right. Um. So here's the thing: where does the practice of celebrating Easter come from? Um. Well, it comes from many places. First off, most notably, uh, and I'm going to bring this back up here for reference. Um. Most notably, the recognition uh, in the form of a festival for the spring equinox, associated with the worship of our sun, the planet Venus, and uh, heavenly luminaries, you know, from season to season. Now, the linguistic correlative uh, relations are all over the place, to say the least, when uh, customs dealing with spring, jump, to move forward um, in time, daylight savings, also the spring jump, move forward relation to the bunny, who is said to lay eggs, but, you know, bunny doesn't lay eggs, um, and uh, is also the sign of new life, uh, which spring brings in regards to the season and, uh, you know, fruits, labor, and whatnot. Also, uh, you know, and when I say, you know, fruits and labor, I'm talking of, uh, you know, fruits and labor, you know, of the land, uh, you know, harvest, not harvest, but, uh, you know, flowers blooming, you know, the trees, uh, trees blooming and buds and and, and the birds chirping and, 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 and nature just coming back out. Um, 
this is all a part of God's divine order. And if you pay specific attention to it, every man, uh, everything that uh, all the animals, uh, you know, and all the birds, you know, they'll, they, you hear the, the singing of the birds and they all have their their own different tone, uh, giving praise to God, the creator. Um, they're giving praise. That's praise. They're singing. Who do you think they're singing to, y'all? Amen. Oh, my goodness. I'm getting off track here, but very relatable. Um, and so uh, also uh, the egg that we were talking about from the uh, female anatomical biology is uh, the product and sign of fertility, which in what we know in pagan traditions have sexual practices in regards to worship, and recognition of uh, polytheism. Polytheism, which is structured on the basis of worship to multiple gods and goddesses. Wait, wait a second. Wait a, wait a second. Multiple gods and goddesses? All right, 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Hold on, let's, let's, let's keep things in perspective here because we're talking about, we're talking about, uh, <laughs> We're talking about multiple gods and goddesses here. What? What does the word say? Uh, uh, do, 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 do. First Corinthians 8. Oh, did I have that right? Let me out, Lord. First Corinthians. Did I, I didn't spell that right. Verse four. Ah, there we go. I spelled it wrong. All right. All right. So uh first Corinthians chapter eight, verse six says, But to but to us there is but one God, the Father. One, not multiple, but one God, the Father, of whom are all things. And we in him and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. One, one. Not multiple gods and goddesses, as uh, polytheism would uh, say. All right. How about uh, Exodus? Is that? Uh, how about that? We got another scripture in regards to this. Precept upon precept, right, Isaiah? Here we go. Here we go. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And where's the rest? <laughs> Thou shalt have no other gods before me. All right? No other gods before me. Now, here's the thing. In this, uh, in this instance, when, when, when the Lord says this, I've always said, uh, you know, like a before, you shouldn't have any other, like, like uh, in, in order of prior, priority. You shouldn't, everything should come secondary. But, Here's the thing, especially when we attribute it to, uh, you know, the New Testament and the New Covenant. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. We are the temples of God, according to the New Testament, where we house Jesus in us. We are the living embodiment of Christ, the temples, not a church, not a building. All right. That means there shouldn't be any type of other God any other type of godly um, um, homage or anything um, to our temple. Now, you know, gods, idols, uh, things that we covet, you know, because covetousness can lead to idol worship, which can lead to gods, things that we give homage to, time. Um, we're I'm talking about in our hearts, in our, in, our, in our minds and spirits, people, not just I was talking to somebody says, thou shalt not have any other gods before me. So I'm like, oh, that means you don't have the God Buddha on your wall. No, that means you don't have anything in your temple. That, not on your physical wall. We're talking about our spiritual walls, folks, our hearts. We're not supposed to have anything before God that resides in us, not in our physical dwellings. That's just a, a beautiful point that I got in the spirit that I wanted to make. Um, so anyway. That polytheism, um, getting back to that. Now, as I mentioned above, Easter coming from many places from a polytheism standpoint is the worship of a deity 
of uh, fertility, which is uh, in its rudimentary form associated with the female. Now, uh, what female deity or deities are we worshiping and celebrating with Easter? All right. This is where we get, in, get into a few things. Okay. Um, this is where we get into a few things. I'm going to drag this over here. All right. Inanna or Inanna, uh, Inanna is an ancient Mesopotamian goddess associated with love, beauty, sex, war, justice, and political power. Um, under the name Inanna, uh, later by Akkadians, Babylonians, and Assyrians of the name Ishtar. All right, this is where we get into the goddess name game, etymology, that phonetic uh, sounds that we were talking about, I uh, believe in the in vivo abomination uh, part one. Um, same god or goddess, um, different dialect, but if you notice, the names across the board are the same, folks. All right. Um, let's go to yesterday, if I'm saying that right. I'm going to butcher a few of these. Lord help me. Yesterday, uh, uh, from Old English, it's yesterday. Um, again, Northumbrian dialect, uh, West Saxon dialect, Old High German. All right. So this is where this is West Germany. Goddess, same goddess, almost sounds like Easter. It's the same thing. What about attributes? Um, we get into, uh, let's see, goddess of the dawn. Um, let's see, connecting Esther with records of Germanic Easter custom. So, so again, how about this one? Oh, and also, where's that uh, story? I made a note here. Etymology. There we go. Uh, let's see. And Ostara, or Old High German. So, uh, you know, before the Western, Western, who is it? Western German, there was Old High German. Linguistic siblings stemming from a common origin. Again, we're talking about the name game here, folks. Um, how about this one? Uh, wait, wait. Uh, let's see. Also, um, dawn, morning, uh, goddess of the, the golden dawn or god goddess of the dawn. Let me see if I can find that here. La, da, da. All right, where was that hat? On here, I'm just trying to make some relations here, folks. Oops, I need to do control fine. Hang on. All right, so uh, also attributed to you, a goddess of the dawn, supported by evidence of cognate names and the goddess of dawn. Is characterized as a reluctant bringer of light for which she is punished. Um, worship during April with hares and eggs and where the tradition of coloring of the eggs originates. All right. We, we see all this. This this is where the traditions come from, folks. This is where, we're, again, we're still on yesterday, if I'm saying that right. I know I'm butchering, but the... All the evidence is here, folks. All right. Um, let's take it a step further. All right. Astarte. All right. It's just Canaanite, Phoenician. All right. Um, Phoenician goddess of war and uh, sexual love. Uh, Aphrodite, uh, yeah, sex, god of war and sexual love. All right. Um, a deity closely related to Ishtar, uh, East Semitic fame. All right. 
this is this is <laughs> oh lord mm. uh how about this one or oh, I, th I think it was uh asteris now you're noticing uh you know the, the, the different parts of the, you know the world and the lands you know where these uh these are all worshiping the same the same. Well, I put an asterisk, but they're bringing it up as that. So, redirected from asterisk. Oh, it was a redirect. Yeah, so, same thing that it's, uh, you know, asterisk is being attributed to this one. But, I mean, we can we can go on forever, which, uh, I mean, for the sake of time, I don't, I don't want to, you know, beat, beat a dead horse here. But, you know, in later times, it started was associated, well, excuse me, worshiped in Syria and Canaan, worship spread to Cyprus, seeing where, you know, it's spreading here. This merged again, this merged. Uh, this is the thing to where it's attributed to the same goddess, um, you know, for different worship purposes across different um, uh, uh, countries. And, and if you know any, notice anything about, remember anything about like the Macedonians and, uh, you know, Alexander the Great. Um, when he overtook um, a, a place, he intermingled the relations, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the the cultures and the religions and the sects um, of, uh, of the cultures and kind of overlapped them, you know, for the sake of, you know, compatibility and, and just transitioning over. And so we see this uh, may have been adopted. OK, that's another word for merger into the Greek pantheon and uh, Mycenae. Uh, Mycenaean and Dark Age times perform Aphrodite, all right? Aphrodite, who is, all right, who is the Greek god or the Greek goddess of what? Of love, beauty, pleasure, passion, procreation, Venus. Um, it's, it's, it goes on and on, folks. Um, it, it really does. I mean, it it it, it really does. Uh, you've got Athena, you've got Venus, you've got Asherah, Semitic goddess. So, like I said, um, you know, a few strong points to consider. The lowercase god or goddess name game, I refer to it as, is that all of these different places are naming different gods or goddesses in this instance. But they are the same person, same characteristics across the board, same attributes. They're describing the same deities. Many names in the list above sound like Easter. And we know from history that many vowels and pronunciation of words were interchangeable between different cultures and tribes due to the scattering of the languages from the Tower of Babel incident and going forward. That's where it, it, it pretty much comes from in regards to, you know, being able to you know, have a lot of these uh, names announced or uh, pronounced differently, but they look the same on paper and, uh, you know, the attributes and characteristics lining up. Um, so uh, let's see, Exodus chapter 23, verse 13. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It says, in, and in all things that I have said unto you, be circumspect, excuse me, be circumspect, meaning um, be be suspect, you know, uh, 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 be skeptical and make no mention of the name of other gods, you know, like, like, like be careful, neither let it be heard out of thy mouth. Now, uh, that gets down to nitty gritty um, because we know the names, a lot of the months. Uh, well, the, uh, a lot of the names of the names of the week, the months of the year, you know, they're uh, they're named by, uh, you know, gods and goddesses. It's one of those things to where the traditions of men have been so deeply encrusted and intermingled and, and, and uh, you know, integrally, you know, uh, um, put into, uh, you know, our everyday language that, uh, you know, the enemy's uh, influence knows no bounds. Um, knows no bounds. It's it's uh, deeply uh, rooted, uh, to say the least. Now, uh, 
the last strong point to consider is that these goddesses can all uh, attribute it, well, can be um, traced back to uh, Semiramis, the wife of Nimrod, um, who was the first powerhouse in the Old Testament to seriously blaspheme God and was influential in the Tower of Babel construction. Let's go here to uh, Ezekiel chapter 8. Verses 13 through 15. And we're going to keep rocking with uh, KJV. It says, He said also unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. Um, Tammuz is the son of Semiramis, who was the wife of Nimrod, whose spirit was said to have impregnated her after Nimrod's death. If you're noticing the similarities between Mary and Jesus, then you're spot on. The enemy likes to imitate, mock, depict God on all levels. Uh, this is a bold nomenclature outlined and is even more evident being this all happened in the Old Testament. Jesus hadn't even come yet, um, was prophesied, but he hadn't even come yet. And the enemy was already attempting to mimic his coming, his birth, with uh, Tammuz in the Epic of Nimrod. As said before, we know the enemy likes to infiltrate and corrupt from within. This is a huge part of why many principles of sacrifice and worship in the temple of God of the Old Testament became, became sacrilegious and turned into abominations to God, which left it desolate, meaning God had to leave. He left the dwelling. The temple of God was left empty, the house. This was not by coincidence or mistake. Yet another ode to man's addendums to the uh, commandments of God being infestuous and corrupted. Now, Jeremiah chapter 14, verses 17 through 29. This is going to be a mouthful here, so bear with me. But this is going to bring about a very strong point in here. It's one of the last strong points that need to be made before I close. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. All praises to you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Here we go. Now, chapter seven, excuse me, chapter 44, verses 17 through 29. Here we go. Now, we will certainly do everything we said we would. We will burn incense to the queen of heaven and will pour out drink offerings to her as we and our ancestors and kings and our officials did in the towns of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. At that time, we had plenty of food and were well off and suffered no harm. But ever since we stopped burning incense to the queen of heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her, we have had nothing and have been perishing by sword and famine. The woman added, when we burn incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings to her, did not our husbands know that we were making cakes impressed with her image and pouring out drink offerings to her? Mm. That jumped out of me with the cakes thing, because mm. <laughs> if, if you do your etymology homework with uh, Christmas and Nimrod, you see where a lot of these uh, traditions come from, even with the cakes and the birthdays. And mm. Anyway, I won't get into that one. Um. We'll continue on. Verse 20. Then Jeremiah said to all the people, both men and women, who were answering him, Did not the Lord remember and call to mind the incense burned in the towns of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem by you and your ancestors, your kings and your officials, and the people of the land? When the Lord could no longer endure your wicked actions and the detestable things you did, your land became a curse and a desolate waste without inhabitants, as it is today. Lord, notice <laughs> they tried to justify their actions because they said, uh, 
just as our ancestors, our uh, our kings and our officials did in the towns of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. It's like they did it. So, you know, we did it. What was wrong? We didn't see any wrong with us doing it because that stringing you along with the traditions of men. Look what happened. I'll reiterate. <laughs> Um, verse 22, when the Lord could no longer endure your wicked actions. Remember, the Lord is long suffering. So it's like he went to and he said, I'm done. I can't look at this no more. When the Lord could no longer endure your wicked actions and the detestable things you did, your land became a curse and a desolate. Remember, we know desolate means uh, without, you know, without. He was there. The anointing was there. The covenant was there and uh, became a desolate waste without inhabitants as it is today. Because you have burned incense and have sinned against the Lord and have not obeyed him or followed his law or his decrees or his stipulations, this disaster has come upon you as now you see. Verse 24, then Jeremiah said to all the people, including the women, hear the word of the Lord and your people of Judah and Egypt. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. You and your wives have done what you said would do when you promised. We will certainly carry out the vows, vows we made to burn incense and pour out drink offerings to the Queen of Heaven. Go ahead then. Do what you promised. Keep your vows. But hear the word of the Lord. All you Jews living in Egypt, I swear by my great name, says the Lord that no one from Judah living anywhere in Egypt will ever again invoke my name or swear as surely as the sovereign Lord lives. Uh, speaking on it, <laughs> for I am watching over them for harm, not for good. The Jews in Egypt will perish by sword and famine until they are all destroyed. Those who escape the sword and return to the land of Judah from Egypt will be very few. Then the, excuse me, then the whole remnant of Judah who came to live in Egypt will know whose word will stand, mine or theirs. Hmm. Chapter, excuse me, verse 29. This will be the sign to you that I will punish you in this place, declares the Lord, so that you will know that my threats of harm against you will surely stand. Ain't no going back on it. <laughs> Ain't no going back on God's word. Whew. Now, Asherah, a.k.a. Astarte, or Asarde, was known as the Queen of Heaven. Astarte, or Asarde, was a Canaan Phoenician goddess. The Canaanites, later the Phoenicians of ancient Carthage, were a heinous group of folks participating in all manner of sacrifices, from newborn babies to animals, um, to their gods and goddesses. Take a strong look at what God told the Israelites about the land of Canaan. In Leviticus chapter 18, verse 3. Thank you, Lord. Oh, my goodness. Oof, just mm, looking at that judgment. My goodness. Oof, Leviticus 18, 3. After the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein ye dwelt, shall ye not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, which I bring you, or whither I bring you, shall ye not do, neither shall ye walk in their ordinances. Don't take after the customs, customs, traditions of them. I'm bringing you out of Egypt to go into the land of Canaan. Don't take on the practices of uh, Egypt that I brought you out of. Don't take on the practices of the land of Canaan that I'm bringing you into which later, you know, uh, became uh, uh, the Phoenicians, Phoenicia. The thing is, as I said before, we know through uh, military conquests, you know, uh, especially with the Macedonians, um, they were intermingling, adopting um, uh, the, the cultures of, of the uh, places they were uh, taking over. Um, so uh, we see. God said, uh, God told the Israelites, you're not supposed to do that. Don't do that. Don't do as the heathens do. All right. Um, now, to the body of Christ, knowing is only half the battle. All right.
knowing there's only half the battle. Now it says, you know, the Israelites. All right. This was an uh, order for the Israelites. Okay. Does that apply to the Jews, you know, to the Gentiles? Excuse me. Does it apply to the Gentiles? All right. It applied to the Israelites. Okay. Does that apply to the whole body of Christ? Are we supposed to be taken on? Is it all right for us? Is it is it all right for us to do so? All right? Is it all right for us to do so? Okay? Remember what he said. I gotta go back on this. That judgment. Look what he said at the end. The Jeremiah, Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29, verse. Um, I'm in 44. That last verse, 29. It says. So that you will know that my threats of harm against you will surely stand. Uh, where was that? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. No, wait, 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 wait. We were at 28. That's what jumped out at me at the end. I'm going to go back. Those who escape the sword and return to the land of Judah from Egypt will be very few. Then the whole remnant of Judah who came to live in Egypt will know whose word will stand, mine or theirs. <laughs> Look at that. Look at that. Look at that line of that, that 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 line in the sand that he drew. Mine or theirs? What did your ancestors do? That's that's fine. In the end, is it going to be the traditions that you you know your ancestors had, or what I said? Is it going to be my word or theirs that you're going to be held accountable for? <laughs> God doesn't play. He don't play. Um, and so uh. I wonder if that applies to us as well. We know that this was the, you know, the Israelites. Does that apply to the body of Christ in these times? So where Easter is still, is, is here. Easter is here. It was in a different form then. But we know, you know, what the enemy does. Keep it moving. Thank you, Robert. Keep it moving. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 26 through 27 says, Do not bring a detestable thing into your house or you like it, will be set apart for destruction, regarded as vile and utterly detested, for it is set apart for destruction. All right, I got to go into the KJV. Come on, Lord, let's get it. Let's get it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm reading it again in KJV. Neither shalt thou bring an abomination into thine house, lest thou be a cursed thing like it. But thou shalt utterly detest it, and thou shalt <clears throat> utterly abhor it, for it is a cursed thing. Mind you, this was the physical house. These were this was the physical house, the temple of God. We're in the New Testament. What house is that applied to now? It's us. I'm beating my chest because I am beating on the door to the house of God, me, our temples. We're not supposed to bring anything into it reverence no way shape or form because it, it lays on our hearts it lays on our mind it lays on our spirits it's laying at the doorstep of the house of god which is us our temples we are not it's a it's an abomination to thine house it's cursed we're supposed to detest it remember it the, the word says if god hates it if jesus we're supposed to hate it too you know um, we're supposed to hate it too. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Now, here's the thing. All right, I'm going to wrap this up. Now, I'm going to end this by referencing the first verse that I started, you know, what started all this for me. All right. That Matthew chapter 7, uh, verse 13 and 14, in regards to the few, first the many. All right. And I'll bring it back up. It says, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, eight. Why is this set there? Man? Bringing it home, folks. Bringing it on home. Amen. Enter ye at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Mm, that few, that that always got me. That 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 few in the, versus the many. I'm gonna bring this up. I'm gonna bring up this link right here. Thank you, glory to God in the highest. Thank you. This uh, says this is Forbes. Now this article, 
it, mind you, is from April 2nd, 2015, all right? Easter in the United States, by the numbers, all right? And I think this is what I quoted right here. This year, 80% of American adults will celebrate Easter. That's good news for business. The average person will spend $140.62 on this year's holiday. All in all, <clears throat> a total planned Easter spending across the United States will amount to $16.4 billion. Now, uh, let's see. Now, mind you, again, that's 2015. In 2021, it was projected uh, Easter spending uh, for American adults would be uh, $21.6 billion. The total Easter-related spending expected in 2021, that means uh, $180 per household. Now, you've got to ask yourself, uh, it says, look at the percentage. It says 80%, 80%, y'all of American adults. What does that represent? That represents 80 out of her. <laughs> we're talking about percentage, y'all. You know, we're out of the hole. So that's 80% of a whole. We're dealing with 100%. You know, are you a part of that 20%, that few, that minority? Ask yourself. Or are you a part of that, uh, that 80%? You know, that majority, the many. As it talks about in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, 14. Are you the few that are traveling that narrow path or uh, the broad one? All right. That ends the first installment uh, for the uh, slaughtering of the sacred cow, with this one being Easter, Easter on the altar. All glory to God in the highest. Oh man, this 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 was a treat, man. This was a treat, and uh, mm, this was a treat. Oh glory! I want to thank uh, all of you for uh, uh, watching and uh, tuning in, and uh, love and blessings to all of you. Have a beautiful weekend with your family. All right, this is the season of you know like Resurrection Sunday and Lent and. Ash and all of, oof, you know, we got to know what we're doing. Who and what are we giving honor and reverence to? You know, are we worshiping in vain? Who's getting the worship? Who's who, who are we? Who is the worship going to? Amen. Glory. You all be safe. Be blessed. Be encouraged. Love you all. Amen.